For a long time, not much was known about the people living on these islands. They developed their own unique language, separate and unintelligible to any outsiders, including the Japanese. Between 1416 and 1429, the separate principalities of the island people were united under one name, the Ryukyu Kingdom. The early history of the new kingdom was prosperous, as much wealth was generated through lucrative trade with the Chinese Empire. This trade was so lucrative that it brought the attention of another nearby power, Japan. In order to trade with China, your nation needed to acknowledge the supremacy of the Chinese Emperor and pay a tribute. The Ryukyu Kingdom happily prospered by participating in the tribute system. But Japan, on the other hand, having an emperor of its own, could not participate. A plan was made. If Japan was to annex Ryukyu, they could conduct trade with China through the islands in secret. But there was another reason why Tokugawa had interest. In 1571, he saw how Spain had seized the Philippines, and he was already noticing the Christian missionaries arriving on Japanese mainland. He feared their influence greatly, and wanted to turn the Ryukyus into a buffer zone that could give the mainland protection from any European invaders. With this in mind, an envoy was sent to Ryukyu capital in Okinawa, demanding that their king submit to the rule of the shogun. The request was treated with great contempt. The rejection of Ayayasu's demands set in motion the invasion, and on 27th of October 1608, the shogun commanded the Shimazu clan to pacify and take control over all of the Ryukyu Islands. An army was assembled. According to the estimates of Stephen Turnbull, the fighting force was about 3,000 strong with an additional 2,000 laborers and 3,000 sailors to support the fighting force of 100 mounted samurai, 700 foot soldiers, 800 Ashigaru soldiers armed with the arquebus guns, 800 Ashigaru armed with traditional spears and 300 bow Ashigaru soldiers. The remaining soldiers would have been mostly attendants to the samurai. The Shimazu army was very well armed and experienced. Considering the relatively high number of soldiers with guns, we can deduce that the Shimazu put a lot of faith in the power of bullets, especially when fired in controlled volleys. With regards to the Ryukyu, the information available on the arms of the soldiers is a lot more sketchy, but it is likely that they had a mixture of weapons at their disposal from both China and Japan, including bows, swords, spears, and most definitely guns. Although the guns they had access to most likely were outdated models coming from China, whereas the Japanese had been making their own for quite some time, based on the arms coming from Europe. The Ryukyu also had cannons, otherwise known as the Ishibiya, whereas the Japanese chose not to bring artillery with them. After gathering their forces, the Shimazu leave from Yamakawa on April 8th. They would have used the Atakabun and Sengokubun to traverse the sea. They arrived peacefully in Kuchinora Bujima the following day. On April 11th, they arrived on Amami Oshima, where the first shots of the campaign were fired. The island was taken by April 20th. Following Amami, fierce resistance is mounted on the island of Tokunoshima on April 24th. The next landing was the island of Okinara Bujima, which surrendered upon the arrival of the army, giving the Shimazu a place to regroup before the final assault on Okinawa Island. April 29th, the Shimazu land on Kurijimima, a small island not far from Onten Harbor, which they planned to take. The major obstacle preventing them landing in the harbor was the Gusuku Onokinjin, a well-fortified castle, which became the first position assaulted on Okinawa. Some Japanese sources claim that there was no battle in Nakijin, and that the defenders fled once they saw the approaching army. However, according to Okinawan sources, an enforcing army was sent from Shuri, with some 1,000 men aiding in advance and that there was an, indeed a major battle. Either way, Nakijin was taken on May 1, giving the Shimazu fleet control of Onten Harbor. On the 3rd of May, the fleet anchored at Yomitan, where they stayed for a short amount of time while causing chaos and destruction in a kind of Japanese blitzkrieg. The news of the army arriving had long spread across the island, causing widespread panic. After Yomitan, the Shimazu started their two-pronged attack on Shuri and Naha city. They split in two, with the fleet making its way to Naha harbor, whereas the rest started a march across the island, advancing towards Shuri castle, where the king of Ryukyu was based. The land army quickly made its way down the island with Uraso castle and the Dahe bridge providing little resistance to Shimazu, who brandished their superior guns and fired them in synchronized volleys. While the land force was having significant success, the navy was pinned down. The Ryukyu harbor was well protected by their cannons, 
and it was too dangerous for Navy to approach it. But Stephen Turnbull further suggests that it may have never been Shimazu's plan to invade the well-defended harbor from the sea. In all likelihood, it was a feint designed to pull more soldiers out to defend the harbor while the land army advanced to Shuri Castle. In fact, feints were somewhat of a Satsuma trademark that they had been using in battle for the last 100 years. Most of the navy retreated from the port and landed its army on the shores of Makiminato, heading towards Shuri. By the time the defenders in Naha realized what was happening, it was already too late and the Shimazu army made quick work of Shuri Castle, with the Archibus Ashigaru providing cover to mount ladders while the samurai quickly scaled them to get onto the ramparts. Shuri Castle was taken and the Ryukyu King was a hostage. The entire operation was a major success for the Japanese, with a short casualty list of some 100 or 200 soldiers. It is possibly one of the most successful military operations in Japan's history, where the battle-hardened Shimazu were able to use their experience from the recent invasion of Korea, where similar tactics were used. As for Ryukyu casualties, we do not have a reliable estimate, but it was certainly far greater. Kingdom was forced to plead loyalty to the Shogun, and with that, all of Tokugawa's plans could be fulfilled. Ryukyu was now a secret vessel of Japan, while still providing tribute to the Chinese, thereby facilitating trade between the two nations. Additionally, Tokugawa now had a buffer zone to protect mainland Japan in case a European force chose to invade. And it most definitely did provide protection, but from a very different enemy in a very different war. When in 1945, the US forces landed in Okinawa, in their push towards Japan. The Ryukyun Islands remained independent to a certain extent. Its royal government structure remained intact alongside its royal lineage, but they were only permitted to operate within a very strict set of guidelines laid down by Japan. These guidelines are what began to take their toll on the Ryukyun culture. They were a direct product of the changing times in Japan and tended towards imperialism and the eradication of foreign cultures. They included severe restrictions on foreign trade, guided emerging diplomacies and even discouraged travel. Ryukyu's existing trade relations with China were turned to Satsuma's interest. Satsuma also had a say in what ships could dock in Ryukyu harbors, an exception to these rules had to be authorized by Satsuma himself, effectively crippling the island's economy. Ryukyu had officially become a vassal of Japan at this time. Culturally, this shift in control is what changed the course of daily life in the island kingdom, since Japan's imperialist ideals were forced on its people. Rukian ethnic identity, tradition and culture was systematically suppressed over time, but it took a turn for the worse during the Meiji era after Japan had transformed from a feudal system into an empire. Japan introduced a public education system that only permitted the use of standard Japanese, while shaming students who chose to speak their own native languages by forcing them to wear plaques around their necks, marking them as dialect speakers. This came as a result of Western ideals being taken up across Japan, when they began to believe the Ryukyu language had become a burden to the one unified Japanese dialect. It's quite common, historically, for a conquered nation to take on the language of their conquerors, a show of loyalty to them, rather than their own kingdom, and this was exactly what happened here. The efforts to render Rukens Japanese through language education became more comprehensive after 1980s when attention shifted from communication to national education. Speaking the Ryukyu dialect was considered unpatriotic once Japanese became a part of standardized society. Japanese language dissemination became an increasingly important instrument forcing Rukens to adapt to mainland customs and traditions. Employees risked being punished if they were caught speaking their native language, while children could also be penalized at school. Anyone addressing a government official in that tongue could be refused service because of it. In short, the implementation of Japanese as a language relied heavily on negative and coercive measures. The Meiji government was seeking to assimilate them into a wider unified Japan and the effects of that mentality can still be seen today since many modern Rukens do not identify themselves as Japanese. Instead, they refer to themselves as coming from the particular island they were born on first and foremost rather than Japanese. Another policy was introduced banning ownership of swords by commoners on the island. And while this had a significant societal effect on the territory, it also led to the development of several unique martial arts that continue to this day. In the 17th century, the Kingdom of Ryukyu was still a vassal of Japan, 
and a tributary of China. It remained like this until it was formally annexed by Japan in 1879 to become the Okinawa Prefecture. China, having lost its tribute, protested this and even approached Ulysses Grant to ask for his aid. One option considered was for Japan to annex the northern islands of its archipelago, while China would annex the Miyako and Yayama Islands leaving the Ryukyu Kingdom independent. However, when these negotiations failed, Ryukyu's government was replaced by the Meiji government. Following these events, hostilities between the Ryukyu and Japan immediately escalated, and this was mostly due to the systematic attempt of mainland Japan to eradicate all trace of their culture. They had all but eliminated their native language, religion, and cultural practices at this point in time. This wasn't the end of their troubles though, as the Ryukyu Islands were next occupied by the United States military government between 1945 to 1950. During this occupation, American military personnel were exempt from domestic jurisdiction since the islands were an occupied territory, which led to a lot of tension between them and the locals. When the Treaty of San Francisco was signed in 1952 officially ending World War II hostilities, the US military continued to control the Ryukyu Islands. The official currency became the US dollar. Cars drove on the right side of roads as opposed to the left in Japan and large military bases were constructed on their soil during this time. Despite an emerging movement towards Ryukyu independence, the US reverted the islands back to Japan in 1972 while retaining all the rights to the military bases on them as part of the treaty to protect Japan. To this day, there are still 30,000 servicemen stationed there, and they have become a dominant feature in daily island life. While Americans provide jobs to the locals on base and pay, Widespread personal relationships between the US and the Okinawa Prefecture remain strained and controversial due to past grievances. If you haven't pressed the subscribe and bell button yet, then make sure to do so now not to miss my future videos. So let me know what you thought about my coverage of the conflict, and in particular if you liked my use of footage from Shogun 2 Total War, because I would like to do more videos like that, and maybe I would recreate some battles in the future in more detail and dig deeper into Japan's history perhaps. Most of my info came from Stephen Turnbull's book, it's a nice short read, and if you want more details on the subject, I think you should check it out. Now guess the location of this scene, and I will see you in the next video.